Hello and welcome to the inaugural Law Asia Human Rights Webinar. This is the first in a series of three webinars that we're going to host on three successive Tuesdays. I'm delighted that each one of you can have made it. We have a very strong panel of 12 speakers, 10 speakers and two commentators. And uh, we are going to have perspectives of access to jurisdiction across several, several countries. I'm delighted to inform you that we have uh, delegates who have registered, from, uh, which, which number 262, and they come from 23 jurisdictions. So we're very, very pleased with your participation. Because of the hour long tight time constraint, each of the speakers will be limiting their presentations to certain highlights of access uh, to uh, access to justice in their respective jurisdictions. And uh, we have a run sheet here. The first person to address you is going to be the president of Law Asia, Mr. Chung Wan Choi. May I call on Chung Wan to make his welcome address. Thank you, Xiang. Uh, greetings from Korea. It is my great pleasure as the President of LoAsia to welcome you all to LoAsia's Human Rights Webinar. Today's session will explore the topic of access to justice during COVID-19. Firstly, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our excellent panelists for today's session. Thank you all for giving of your time to assist with this important initiative. I would also like to welcome each of you attending this session. We are very honored to have more than 260 members, including from Asia Pacific region, Europe, and the Americas. To those across the globe, I wish you a good morning. And to our American friends, thank you for staying up to join us. LoAsia was created over 50 years ago based on the shared understanding among the legal profession in Asia and the Pacific region of the importance of forming a regional organization of law associations, lawyers, judges, and jurists. Since its inception, Law Asia has operated to promote the cross-jurisdictional exchange of legal knowledge as a voice of legal profession and as a conduit for encouraging adherence to mutually held principles of the rule of law, access to justice, and the protection of human rights. In support of our mission, LoAsia hosts various conferences annually. These conferences offer participants an opportunity to learn from highly esteemed speakers, to collaborate, and to share knowledge and information. We are living in unprecedented times, unfortunately, the timing of Law Asia's conferences this year has been affected by the escalation and spread of novel coronavirus and the travel restrictions imposed internationally. Despite being unable to physically participate in conferences for the time being, I believe we should do our best to continue performing our duties, enriching our knowledge, and exchanging our experiences. While I was disappointed to have had to cancel our second human rights conference in Kathmandu, I'm pleased to be offering this human rights webinar series to support our members enrich their knowledge in this time of new normal. To ensure we continue to deliver the level of service our members expect, I'm pleased to announce that Law Asia will be hosting a further series of webinars later this year on a broad range of legal topics. I will send you all further information about these plans shortly. We will also continue with our important advocacy work and will issue digital Law Asia newsletters and our Asian Jurist magazine with a focus on Asian lawyers' role in responding to the pandemic. In the current climate of the world, grappling with the impacts of COVID-19. Many states have adopted emergency measures, often at the expense of established human rights protections. 
Now, more than ever, law Asia's presence as an important advocate for the protection of established legal pr principles has never been more important. We all have a role to play in ensuring that despite the circumstances, respect for the fundamental principles of the rule of law, access to justice and human rights are maintained. We cannot let exceptional or emergency powers that may be necessary now become a precedent for the future infringement of our rights. We at LOASIA will continue to devote ourselves to working with our members to promote social justice and global rule of law principles in Asia and the Pacific region and beyond. We will also continue to collaborate with other international legal organizations to ensure global adherence to these important principles. So I'm very great, thrilled that the president of UIA, Mr. Jerry Roth, is a panelist at today's session, and I welcome future collaboration with the UIA on these important initiatives. Our strength lies in unity. I believe that through shared learning and collaboration, we will find solutions to common problems and help build an international legal network focused on the betterment of society despite the challenges we all currently face. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, President Chum Wan Choi. Uh, a useful reminder about the emergency powers. May I now request Michael Tidball, Secretary General, Law Asia, to please address the conference. Good evening to you all, and thank you for making the time to join us today. I would like to extend a special thank you to the organisers of this webinar and to our excellent panel of experts. We at Law Asia were extremely disappointed to have had to make the difficult decision to cancel or postpone a number of events scheduled for this year due to the impact and spread of the novel coronavirus. But I'm delighted that despite the challenges, we are still able to connect with you and can continue to offer you enriching educational opportunities like this webinar today. When we look back at 2020 in the years to come, it will undoubtedly stand out as one of the most difficult years in recent history from a health, economic and social justice perspective. To respond to the impact and spread of the COVID-19 virus, nations throughout the world have adopted extraordinary powers. Emergency and lockdown measures imposed in almost every jurisdiction have forced us to adapt like never before, while almost every aspect of economic or social activity has been affected by this pandemic. It is fitting that the first session in our Human Rights Webinar Series focuses on access to justice during COVID-19. As legal professionals and representatives of lawyer associations from across the world, we have all a very important role to play in helping to ensure that despite the current challenges, fundamental rights to access to justice are not necessarily curtailed. It is incumbent upon all of us to use our understanding of the legal system and our relationships with law and policy makers within our respective jurisdictions to help shape innovative and inclusive measures that enhance access to justice in the current environment, particularly for the most disadvantaged among us. Those of us who represent lawyer associations also have a unique duty to support the legal professions, professionals within our jurisdictions and to provide them with the tools they need to continue to provide vital legal services. We're indeed living in an unprecedented and what we would term extraordinary time. However, while we may be forced to accept certain limitations of our freedoms now, the current situation does not make those rights less relevant. It makes them more important than ever. We at Law Asia 
will continue to devote ourselves to fulfilling our important mission of advocating in defence of access to justice, human rights protections, and the rule of law in our region and beyond. We look forward to working with our regional and international counterparts in pursuit of these aims. I invite you all to help us in this very important mission. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I'm honoured to invite Jerry Roth, President of the UIA, to address us. Jerry, the platform is yours. Thank you. It's a real honor to be here with Law Asia tonight from San Francisco, where, as you may know, we're facing a number of challenges right now. Um, it is midnight here, so I have every incentive to keep within my uh, time limit. Uh, but I'm actually wearing two hats today, uh, tonight. First of all, I'm currently president of UIA, as has been mentioned, which is the Union Internationale des Avocats, the world's oldest international law association founded in 1927 with thousands of members around the world. We have our headquarters in Paris. We have been closely tracking access to justice issues since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. And of course, there have been many different circumstances around the world in different countries, as I'm sure we're gonna hear from the other speakers today. But a couple of common points common points of concern, I would say, uh, continue to emerge. Overall, a lot of systems, many systems, have really made efforts to adapt, sometimes in ways that are uh, working well, sometimes in ways that have not been effective. There are other systems we have seen that have not really taken a lot of steps to try to deal with the situation. And worse yet, there are some systems in which the governments appear to be taking advantage or trying to take advantage of the situation by actually restricting access to justice in various ways. I, I can say that virtually all of the adaptations we're seeing, even the successful ones, appear to have been for the most part ad hoc, um, unplanned, somewhat rushed, reviewed by only a few people, if anyone, um, and certainly not voted upon in the normal course. And we have only minimal data at this point about their efficacy. So there is a lot of work to do in the months and years to come as to what we've seen and how the system will continue. But let me, I just wanted to run through a couple of common issues that we have seen. First of all, most systems are deciding that emergency or urgent cases should be heard ahead of less, uh, less urgent cases. The problem is there is no real definition, no real definition established as to what makes a case uh, emergency or not. Uh, and so there are criminal cases where people are in jail, those often go to the head of the line, but criminal cases where people are not in jail, they're not detained, those go to the back of the line often, and other cases which can be really important, consumer action, small contract disputes, uh, other cases that are arising from COVID are not being handled in a, in a uh, speedy manner. Um, there are limitations on online access for marginalized communities who may not have computers and iPhones and all the things we're using right now to be online. Um, even if they do, we have community, we have folks who have families around them that makes it very difficult for them to participate, children, elder folks that they're taken care of. And that has not been addressed by many of the systems that we've been looking at. There's a real reduction in transparency. A, a, a hearing online is not as transparent as a hearing in a public courtroom where anybody can walk in, sit down, and observe. Oftentimes, you have to be invited to one of these Zoom panels uh, or get a registration number or have some other way of accessing it. And we do see a reduction in transparency, which raises all kinds of concerns from the general public interest in our justice system to issues of corruption. We have seen systems that have relieved uh, parties from deadlines that are very important, uh, that, that apply normally, but this has not universally been the case. And where, it, where there are these relief uh, provisions from deadlines that have been missed, they are not being consistently applied in some places, and we see judges using that actually to make decisions on the merits by either granting a dispensation or not, as they will. 
Um, where there are hearings allowed, we see uh, lots of different provisions being taken care of, uh, being imposed in order to protect the health of participants, but again, not consistent. And we've seen uh, certainly jurisdictions where people who work in the courts feel that their health concerns have not been sufficiently taken into account. There have been limitations on legal aid across many jurisdictions and funding of legal aid, which obviously has a huge impact on access to justice. Other budgetary restrictions in terms of the number of courts available, the number of time slots available. Serious issues about who is deciding all of these determinations, who is making all of these determinations. Is it individual judges? Is it the chief judge of the district? Is it the legislature who should be deciding this? Is it the executive? Is it the mayor? Um, in San Francisco, we've had some circumstances where the mayor has issued orders that have impacted the courts and there's been a little bit of a dispute uh, between our chief judge and our mayor and it's certainly not clear anywhere that we can look as to who prevails. There have been logistical issues, uh, there have been concerns about not there being insufficient numbers of lawyers in many jurisdictions because lawyers are suffering financially in so many, in so many places, businesses down and a lot of smaller firms, a lot of younger lawyers, a lot of more marginalized lawyers are having difficulty. Um, lastly, there, on a positive note, the role of bar associations has been critical across the world. Uh, bar associations have played a very positive role and have been trying to help on a lot of these different areas. And I'm gonna use my last 30 seconds to talk about the United States. We have a lot of different systems, federal and state, and all of our states vary. But the issue that is concerning most of us here in the United States is our jury trial system. You can do a hearing online, but you cannot do a jury trial online. You cannot, the jurors have to be in the same room. They have to hear the same evidence. They have to have contact with the witnesses and the evidence. They have to deliberate with one another. They have to be protected from outside influence. And so far, we haven't found, there has not been reports of successful jury trials. I've seen some but I haven't been able to verify that any have really been conducted. That issue is gonna be exacerbated by our current this, uh, unrest in the United States, which, is, which has many people being arrested and many people who are gonna need trials. So with that, I see my time is up and I'm gonna pass the baton back to you, Shion. Thank you very much, Jerry. May I call on Pauline Wright, President, Law Council of Australia, to share her views. Thank you, Pauline. Thanks very much, John. COVID-19 hasn't halted the top cogs of justice, the emergence of legal issues, nor the need for members of the community to protect and defend their legal and community. Pauline, may I just, I'm sorry, Pauline, may I just request you to raise your voice a little? Sure. Okay. Thank you. I'll try. Thank you. It has, however, tested and transformed how justice is administered and accessed in Australia, as in many other jurisdictions, as no doubt we're going to hear. In addition, COVID-19 responses have led to a surge in legal issues related to domestic violence, employment, hardship applications, insolvency and tenancy disputes. Australian courts and tribunals have shifted to holding remote hearings wherever possible, postponed non-urgent matters and sought to accommodate and prioritise urgent matters. Similarly to Jerry, it's been um, jury trials have been suspended, um, although some are starting to be listed again um, in the near future. Australia's Family Court and Federal Circuit Court have led the way by announcing a new court list to quickly deal with parenting disputes requiring urgent attention as a result of COVID-19. During this pandemic, the Law Council of Australia has established an information sharing group comprised of the Federal Attorney General, Federal Heads of Jurisdictions, myself, and the President of the Australian Bar Association to discuss challenges posed by the pandemic and share procedural and technological solutions. Certain groups within Australia have been particularly vulnerable to the health, social, and economic impacts of COVID-19. These include Indigenous Australians, People with a disability, older people, uh, prisoners. Pauline. Yes. Uh, I'm getting a feed from sub from the on the chat, which seems to suggest that apart from me, others are also unable to hear you with clarity. 
uh, even despite our testing the microphones. And I think what you're saying is very important. So if there is something which you could do to increase the clarity, thank you. I believe that's better. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, is that better? All right. So, as I was saying, um, particular groups are more vulnerable, and they include Indigenous Australians, people with disabilities, older people, prisoners, people in immigration detention, asylum seekers, temporary visa holders, and homeless people. This vulnerability is compounded by existing barriers that these people um, already face in protecting and defending their human rights. They're disproportionately represented in the legal system. They have more complex needs, and yet they're often left behind in policy responses. Online legal services and dispute resolution, which has been fast-tracked by the COVID-19 pandemic, presents both challenges and opportunities for the delivery of justice to marginalised and vulnerable groups. In terms of opportunities, this has the potential to transform the ways in which some marginalised groups and people living in rural and remote areas access legal advice and representation and elevate their ability to protect and defend their rights. Online courts and tribunals can certainly simplify procedures. They can eliminate unnecessary and expensive formal correspondence and reduce litigation costs. But this shift does come with inherent challenges. Firstly, it can exacerbate the disadvantage and marginalisation of people with limited access to technology if they've got unreliable internet connections or really bad sound, <laughs> or those who lack the skills to use technology and online services. Older people, people experiencing homelessness or poverty, and people in remote areas are particularly vulnerable to this digital exclusion, highlighting the need for jurisdictions to continue to facilitate access to telephone and face-to-face -face legal and justice services where required. They're never going to be replaced. Secondly, we must be careful not to lose the community-wide advantages of the face-to-face -face delivery of justice. Open justice and a local presence of courts combats mistrust of the justice system. It provides a tangible reminder of the law in operation and it fosters local respect for the law. Also, face to face relationships between legal advisors and marginalised communities are often crucial in building trust and respect, both of which contribute to positive justice outcomes. During the emergency and the recovery phase, lawyers and lawyers' associations should continue to draw attention to the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups and endeavour to discern best practices or other binding principles to ensure equitable access to justice in times of emergency. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, I next request Aswini Viraratne uh, to address the panel. She's the Queen's Council and is addressing us from London. Aswini? Uh, good morning from London. Um, thank you, uh, Loija, for the honour of um, participating in this webinar. Uh, I'm Aswini Weeraratna, and as Sham says, I'm a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. I'm going to try and give you a few words, uh, give you a flavour of how the system to of access to justice is working in the UK, and uh, whether and how it's working for vulnerable and marginalised people. And some of the things that have already been said by both Jerry and Pauline are, are a very apposite to our situation. And so I'm going to try not to um, duplicate what they've already said. In our system, which is beleaguered by decades of government cuts, this is a group that was already struggling to access justice before COVID-19 swooped. And as in other jurisdictions, there are three essential problems to overcome. You have to firstly access a lawyer, you have to access a court or a hearing, and of course, uh, the, the essential of open justice with access to the public and media. No one wants courts to retreat behind closed doors. It's only fair to acknowledge that uh, the court service and judiciary here are working flat out to keep the system recognized as a vital public service, explicitly recognized. Um, so preventing it from running down 
uh, during, um, during the lockdown. Barristers are designated as key workers alongside health care staff and others to continue working with the public. There are some priority courts that are available for urgent face-to-face -face work, but by far the majority of work is being conducted remotely. On the criminal side, uh, courts were suspended altogether due to the, as Jerry said, the practicalities of running jury trials safely. But those restarted in four selected courts throughout the country last week with special arrangements such as the use of separate courtrooms for the public and for jury deliberations and social distancing and infection control measures for all. So the buildings are being used differently and for fewer trials, of course. Civil and family courts are required to use existing video and telephone technology wherever possible, and that is a problem. How this is achieved practically is a decision that's been left uh, to each judge in each case. So even in a case with three parties, eight experts, four witnesses of fact, uh, lawyers in each case are expected to work out how to proceed, on which platform to proceed, and what the practicalities are. So lawyers and judges are learning fast to adapt to advocacy styles and to use well-organized e-bundles. Bookmarks are essential, I can tell you. In theory, uh, you can, if you want to challenge government failure in relation to lockdown regulations and restrictions or obtain a domestic violence injunction or challenge detention in a psychiatric institution, you can. But if you're a litigant in person or a vulnerable person without access to a lawyer, a remote access is a real challenge. It's by no means business as usual for anyone. So hearings are slow and tiring and technology as we've heard is glitchy with connections and equipment failures. I've conducted video hearings where I was the only person on the video staring at myself. Everyone else had to join by phone because the video link didn't work for them. Vulnerable clients and personal litigants are really struggling, often accessing a hearing on a small smartphone because they don't have any other equipment, which raises uh, questions over accessibility. And even where the equipment is provided to them, uh, we've heard uh, poor broadband speeds, Wi-Fi connections are leading to frozen screens and missed evidence. Um, Nuffield Foundation research reported significant concerns about fairness and effective participation. Uh, the lack of face-to-face -face contact makes it really difficult to read reactions in a virtual room and to be sensitive to vulnerable litigants. So while lawyers and judges are applauding themselves and getting through a hearing, the reported experiences of lay parties and observers has been of alienation from the chumminess that can exist between lawyers and judges online and the difficulty following proceedings. The formality of a hearing is often a casualty, which of course in some situations may be a good thing. I recently conducted a video hearing on a mental health case with an interpreter who was not in the same room as the person they were interpreting for and every other participant in a different location. This was a challenging situation in the extreme. From my perspective as a judge, we got through the hearing, but was it fair to the vulnerable person at its heart? I'm not so sure. At the moment, and while some form of lockdown persists, uh, a key problem which needs a solution, if, you, if you're in an institu institution or homeless or locked down with an abusive partner or parent, is accessing a lawyer in the first place, let alone the challenges of getting into the courtroom. Ultimately, I think that the new normal for hearings will most likely row back to a middle ground here until there is investment into perfecting the technology. There's likely to be a considerable pushback on hearing complex cases remotely, and there needs to be a lot of work done uh, on accessing justice for vulnerable and marginalized people, because the standards of accessibility and participation must not be diminished. Uh, I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aswini. And may I now call on uh, Dr. Deepika Udagawa, Chairperson of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka, to share her views. Uh, Deepika, you may have to just unmute your microphone since we're all anxious to hear you. Can you hear me now? Thank you. We can hear you clearly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. A real pleasure to join you. So thank you to Loisha and to, Sh to Sham, uh, in particular for this invitation. Well, I think speaking about access to justice in this, during this very difficult time cannot be done in isolation. That's very clear because in uh, jurisdictions where access to justice can be strong,
transitional periods, access to justice is so much better than uh, in uh, jurisdictions where access to justice habitually is problematic. And I think many of our jurisdictions, even in normal times, suffer from the fact that a vast majority of people do not have the idea, you know, uh, access to justice in, um, uh, when you discuss it in a traditional sense, that is access to courts. Um, in Sri Lanka, I just want to raise four points here because time is very limited. One is that when uh, this pandemic broke out, I think because we were all very concerned about social distancing and so on, uh, the courts were closed for nearly two months and that really affected canvassing of rights when there were very serious issues of uh, rights. Uh, that was uh, problematic. However, the magistrates' courts remained open because they prioritized bail applications for which we were very um, uh, grateful. So that was a very uh, problematic, the closure of courts. Uh, now we see jurisdictions where uh, the court officials and lawyers were declared an essential public service. And I must say, we are very inspired by those steps. And that's something that means Sri Lanka must think for the future, that in periods of uh, emergency, um, that uh, the justice system should be considered as an uh, uh, essential service. The second is, even though uh, times are very difficult, and we consider this to be a very dark period, there are certain ad hoc measures. Some of the uh, uh, speakers spoke about ad hoc measures. Some of these ad hoc measures, I think if we do canvas, even during normal times, could provide uh, greater access to justice. Just to give you an example, during this period, the Human Rights Commission got complaints about from women who could not collect their maintenance payments because the courts were closed, the register, uh, registries were not functioning normally. And so the Legal Aid Commission um, uh, and other entities, including the Human Rights Commission, were exploring um, simpler methods of uh, uh, whereby uh, these women could collect their uh, maintenance. Uh, not necessarily very successful, but the very fact that we're thinking of simplifying the procedures, I think bodes well for the future. Another very good development is the fact that uh, based hearings have been prioritized and also now and unlike in normal situations bail granting of bail has become the norm because in normal situations uh, the norm is uh, rejection of bail applications very few uh, do get uh, bail and so as a result you find at any point in time in the prison system in Sri Lanka about 55 to 60 percent of the inmates are um, remandis or pretrial detainees, which is not healthy at all. And this is something that the Human Rights Commission has raised and others have raised and needs to be addressed. Right now, we find that as many as possible are being granted bail and refusal of bail is the um, exception. And this is because of the concern that prisons ought not to be overcrowded, which is a very real concern. So there are also silver linings. So if we can make these features a part of the permanent uh, system, even in normal times, I think that would be uh, really very good. So as they say, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And some of these, um, I think, new uh, uh, steps, although seen as ad hoc right now, um, could serve um, uh, normal times as well. The third point I wish to raise is, uh, when we speak of access to justice, we always speak about the judicial system. And I see this as a very serious limitation. A majority of the people who do not, cannot access courts. Um, even in criminal cases where the state, of course, prosecutes and so on, defense is really very difficult for a lot of people because of very limited uh, um, uh, legal aid. Uh, there are court appointed lawyers, true, but we do recognize that there are serious limitations in the system. So this is an opportunity for us to think about expanded legal aid, expanded role of the Bar Association, but more so expanded role for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. In Sri Lanka, research has pointed to the fact that about 60% of litigants prefer to go to mediation boards uh, than go to court simply because people do not understand the procedures. Procedures are very dilatory. Uh, there is, uh, um, you know, um, uh, laws, delays, uh, people cannot afford the fees, and so on and so forth. 
Um, so during this period, when the courts were closed, let's say the Human Rights Commission remained open. And there can be many other institutions like ombudsman's officers and so on, which can play a very important role. It is very clear that, if, I don't know whether there'll be a post COVID period in the near future, but it is very clear some of the major issues that are going to come up in terms of justice are going to be social issues in terms of uh, you know, people being uh, sacked, people needing uh, support from the state, et cetera. So these uh, claims or these uh, issues uh, ideally should not have to go to courts. There should be tribunals that are close at hand uh, for people to um, appeal to. So, um, I mean, there was a lot of discussion about marginalized groups, which is absolutely the case. So in Sri Lanka, we see issues relating to disabled persons, issues relating to minority groups, uh, concerns about discriminatory practices. We see problems relating to migrant workers. And indeed, workers who are extremely concerned about retrenchment and so on. So um, for a lot of these people accessing courts, uh, is, you know, it's, it's difficult even under normal circumstances. So I think we need to expand our conversation about alternate dispute resolution mechanism. And fourthly, I saw a question posed by one of the participants as to whether, given the exigencies of this situation, whether the idea about human rights should change or whether the, uh, the definition of human rights should change, I would say, good heavens, no, absolutely not. I think what we need to understand is that there is such a strong body of international as well as constitutional jurisprudence around the world about protecting human rights during periods of emergency. So I think we need to focus on that. Now, currently, a right that's going to be very uh, keenly canvassed is going to be privacy, data protection because it's a public health uh, issue. Um, so we need to explore this within the framework of uh, the constitutional balances that are brought in, international legal obligations that are brought in to uh, balance exigencies of an emergency with uh, human rights concerns. So this is a time when our consciousness about human rights protection needs to be greater. Uh, that's absolutely the case because this is a time when many states are acquiring a lot of emergency um, uh, powers. So my main point here is that access to justice should not be discussed only uh, in regard to accessing courts. I think uh, we are letting down a majority of people when we speak only about the formal uh, judicial uh, system. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Deepika. And may I call on Dr. Bill Q. Wang of the Gongam Human Rights Foundation to address us. Bill Q, please. Yeah, um, in Korea, in terms of lockdown uh, measures, we have been very cautious and have tried to introduce less uh, restrictive measures with no official general lockdown adopted in this country. Fortunately, there is no serious problem with the operation of judicial system right now, even though there have been some delays in court hearings and some test cases of virtual hearings. Courts and public prosecutors' offices have adopted very strict uh, social distancing measures, and we hope uh, this will work to maintain the judicial system as it is now. Talking about access to justice in a broader sense, uh, I think I have to mention the most vulnerable people in pandemic situations, that is people infected, isolated, or quarantined. In some countries, due process and proper treatment in place relating to uh, isolation and quarantine. But it is not the case uh, with many other countries like Korea. There is a lack of substantial right to habeas corpus, right to counsel, or right to appeal. In Korea, there have been at least hundreds of thousands of people quarantined, but it's been almost impossible to hear their voices because of social phobia and stigma against them. People say uh, Korea has been relatively successful in the fight against the COVID-19, but we have this issue of a high degree of state surveillance, contact uh, tracing closely following the movement of people through their cell phones and credit cards. The right to privacy and personal information has been inc seriously encroached upon, but it's been very hard to raise the issue because of the general public's uh, fear of the pandemic. Electronic wristbands were introduced without legal grounds, 
to identify whereabouts of those who violated self-quarantine rules. They say wearing these wristbands is a voluntary process requiring the consent of people wearing this, but if you don't agree to wear, you will be detained and fined. I think this is a typical way of shaking the foundation of and destroying the rule of law. Vulnerable people become more vulnerable in pandemic situations, discriminated, stigmatized, and excluded. There have been cases of inappropriate group isolation of people with mental disabilities in a crowded facility, rejection of providing shelters and disaster allowances to the, to the homeless, exclusion of most, mi most migrants and refugees from public masks and municipal and central government disaster allowances, and so on. Workers, especially precarious workers, have been forced layoffs, unpaid leaves, and work in danger of infection. Like in many other countries, in Korea, bar associations, legal professionals, human rights NGOs, the National Human Rights Commission, and the civil society as a whole raised the issues just mentioned, trying to achieve the balance between containing the pandemic, protecting human rights, and facilitating access to justice. Throughout this process, we have realized that we desperately need On, among human rights legal professionals in order to make um, human rights and access to justice prevail in the time of COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill Q. Um, and now for a perspective from Malaysia, may I request Murad to share his views. If in case any of you are bored, let me start with this. Row, row, row your boat gently down the street. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. But during COVID-19, it was not a dream, nor was it a breather in Malaysia. From 18th March 2020 to 3rd May 2020, we were in almost total lockdown. The only thing allowed to move and wander around were things associated with essential services, which basically involves four items, food related, medical related, security related, and state governance. Sadly, judicial and legal services do not come under the classification of essential services. Hence, during this tenure of uh, lockdown, we had very limited access to justice and very limited access to solicitors and advocates. During this time, priority were given only to important or urgent criminal cases, registration, charging of uh, fresh cases, and that too in a very ill-prepared scenario. Very few courts function, very few judges were invited to attend to matters, and the sad part, of this whole tenure was that sometimes we have to search our soul to ask ourselves when we are there, whether our fellow brethren who are brought in handcuffs and chains in a group of 50 to 120 of them, like a pack of wolves, are human beings, are animals, or are they something totally worthless before the eyes of justice? They were not given face masks, they were not given all the protective gears, including sanitation and temperature checks and whatnot. And they were all clung together in one group, almost literally sitting on top of each other on the floor. And um, the judge could not do much. The judicial system could not do much, simply because it involves other authorities like the prison wardens, the police and whatnot to bring them to the court and to take them back to detention. And during this time, several interesting developments took place. One, many of these people who are clung together, chained together, and locked together were found to become positive later in terms of COVID-19. Not just them, the migrant and illegal workers who were hauled up, probably because of the news that in Singapore, most of those who found to be COVID-19 positive were migrant workers 
So Malaysia too went on the path to go literally after all these migrant worker settlement and uh, residential colonies and uh, pick them up. Picking them up is just one part of news. But after picking them up, they were all placed in camps. And that's where all hell broke loose. Almost all of them were found to be in one way or another, of one stage or another, COVID-19 positive. They were not probably before, but the way they were kept together without proper facilities, without social distancing, without the full practice of health requirements, created all this mess and unwanted scenarios. Other than this, there's another dimension I would like to share. For I do not want to repeat much of what Brother Jerry Roth and Sister Aswini shared, which also applies in Malaysia otherwise. The fact that in Malaysia, during this COVID-19, we also had a change of government. And the new prime minister was appointed by the king, not from the group which was elected by the public or by the people. And then the natural thing happens usually in a parliament, in a democracy, is to check your strength through word of confidence. But up to now, the parliament has been locked down. It sat for a short while on the 18th of May, merely to hear the king speak and then locked down again. There were attempts and notices given to, for the word of no confidence to be challenged, but it has not seen the light of day up to now. Independent of this, access to justice also not available to civil and contract matters because limitation of time, which would have set in during that, those two months of COVID-19 lockdown in Malaysia. There is no law which has been amended to say that those two months matters not and that you could still file thereafter post MCO or movement control order limitations. Likewise, in terms of Employment Act, a lot of people lost their job. A lot of people were retrenched or terminated or, or removed from employment. They too would want to go to the courts to challenge the validity or the efficacy of the termination. They too cannot file their matters yet. Everything has been deferred until things become better another day. When would that be? How deep? How far? How long will this impact of COVID-19 will affect justice and fairness and equality in Malaysia? I cannot answer that question. And let's pray for the best. With that, Sham, I hope I give you more time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Murad. And may I now call on Satoko Kitamura, the chairperson of the International Human Rights Committee of the JFBA, to share her views. Satoko. Thank you very much, Sham and Loisha, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to, to join this seminar. Um, I would like to focus on the issue of access to court due to time limitation. The state of emergency by the Jab government of Japan was declared on 9th April and started to be partly lifted from May 14th and finally lifted nationwide on 25th May. The state of emergency in Japan is non-legally binding and the government actually did not request court to close. However, the court reacted to the state of emergency declaration by postponing almost all trial dates and only limited number of cases were held as scheduled, such as civil preservation cases, habeas corpus, and domestic violence cases, etc. Et the most serious impact by the court decision has been on the criminal defendants physically detained so not only the Japan Federation of Bar Associations, but many local bar associations called on court to decide postponements cautiously, as well as to permit bail for defendant physically detained if postponement was not unavoidable. The crucial point is that court decision of postponements of trial date was not based on law, but based on its own action plan. While I understand the necessity for court to taking preventive measures against pandemic, it is not justifiable to restrict the right to speedy trial beyond the minimum necessary extent. In this regard, I think that court reaction to postpone almost all trial date was beyond the minimum necessary extent. The court could have kept open to more cases by limiting the number of visitors, changing layout of courtrooms, letting judges and staff wear face shields, and or using IT technology much more. Regarding IT technology, 
introduction of IT had not been progressed so much in Japanese judicial system, but we need to prepare for the second wave anyway. I hope that the Japanese government will allocate proper budget to expedite introducing digital system into court procedure so that the trial can keep going on even in pandemic. If the government will do it, in near future, the court might be able to lend the device for free to the party who doesn't have it in order to secure equal opportunity of access to virtual court procedures. This is already happening in education field. Some local governments in Japan have started or is starting to distribute tablets for free to the families who don't have the equipment in order to ensure equal, equal opportunity for children's access to e-learning. So I hope the same thing will happen in judicial system. The role of bar associations are also crucial. Many bar associations in Japan called on courts to keep open, and here is one success story. Saitama Bar Association, which is located in the neighboring prefecture of Tokyo, succeeded in making Saitama District Court decide not to postpone the trial date of criminal cases. Also, they succeeded in making the local detention facilities cancel their decision to prohibit all meetings of inmates with their families and have them permit such meetings if lawyers would submit a letter to explain the necessity of meeting in advance. In doing so, that bar association also proposed preventing measures for both visitors and inmates against infection of virus, which were accepted by the facilities. This is an example that the bar associations with enthusiasm can play an important role for securing access to justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satoko. And may I now call on Saroj Himre of the Supreme Court Bar Association of Nepal. Uh, I just take 10 seconds to thank Saroj for all the effort on behalf, I'm thanking you on behalf of Law Asia and Professor Yasushi Higashizawa and myself, uh, in particular as co-chairs of the Human Rights Section, for all the effort which you put in in organizing the Kathmandu Conference, which alas could not be held. But uh, please, uh, Saroj, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sam, and uh, thank you to all the team of the Law Asia and distinguished speakers. Uh, we too regret that we are not able to hold the second Law Asia Human Rights Conference, but nevertheless, I hope in the days of the years ahead, we'll be definitely organizing that event that we, our dream was quite uh, aborted by the COVID-19. Uh, the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic has seriously threatened uh, the worldwide, and we are not the exceptions. In Nepal, everything is locked down. The economy is stagnant, and we are in the lockdown for more than two months now. And thousands of the citizens, they are stranded at the, at the border side. And uh, each day, well, every day, I mean, new cases are reported in the news uh, about the COVID-19. So if I uh, talk briefly about the access to justice scenario, then the lockdown has definitely created barriers for the access to justice of and the functions of judicial and quasi-judicial bodies are suspended. Only the cases related to the Hibis corpus and the COVID are entertained by the courts and all proceedings are not there. Hence, uh, the, access, uh, the access to justice mechanism in terms of the easy physical access is beyond the scope of the citizens. The substantive reparations to the victims is also suspended and monitoring of the situations from the point of view of access to justice and human rights is not seen to be uh, much effective. The whole state resources, definitely um, the state is taking more focus uh, against combating the COVID-19. Uh, when the state is focusing into this one, definitely the uh, exit justice is seen to be less prioritized and ignored from the side of the government. Victims are not only facing lockdown physically, they are facing lockdown economically, psychologically, socially, and from other aspects too. Their access to the courts are restricted and the legal remedy is out of their reach. Various legal complexities we can observe in all areas of laws in contract, in, in, in criminal justice, in civil justice, and uh, limitations are kind of thing. And that's why the, uh, the COVID-19 is becoming more serious, challenging, and complex in terms of the, of the 
access to justice. If I talk about the role of the lawyers, Nepalese lawyers have definitely played a very instrumental role in that one. I must thanks to all the lawyers who have been continuously uh, filing the writ petitions in the Supreme Court. More than 20 OBT related cases have been filed. In one, two cases, in one case, I personally represented the Supreme Court Bar Associations and on my own initiation, so I have filed a case regarding to the human rights issues in the Supreme Court. And in most of the cases, the Supreme Court has issued the interim order. However, the uh, the the guidance of the interim order is not seen to be much effective from the government sides. Um, uh, I myself, uh, I mean, uh, the PIL cases that are mostly related with the gender-based violence, need of immediate relief and rescue, availability of interim protection mechanism for the victims, the prisoners health and safety, including the children's uh, juvenile delinquents early release, the easy accessibility and availability of the food and services, educate arrangements of quarantines and rescue of migrant workers, the physical torture and harassment that has been committed by the security forces are some of the major issues that we raised and the PI lawyers there is in the Supreme Court of Nepal. The rule of our associations uh, is uh, being so important in this part also, because the Bar Association, the Nepal Bar Association and Supreme Court Bar Associations are founding on the principle of the rule of law, democracy, human rights, and access to justice. And the Bar Association has definitely created a very, played a very important role from the time the COVID-19 is pressed in Nepal. Both the Bar Associations, they have demonstrated their concern to ensure that access to justice and available of safe manner and uh, to the victims are secure. And they suggested for the judicial institutions to ensure that the safety measures are adequately adopted. The bar associations, they also call for the adequate arrangements for the case management in the court so that justice seeker could safely appear to the courts and by their lawyers. There was a plan to introduce the e-filing and it is not implemented yet. We expect that this will happen soon. And the bar has equally taken care of the human rights by means of judicial measures and other economic support. The bar has created the fund for the lawyers to support them. And bar associations have called the Supreme Court to ensure that access to justice uh, and give the way to secure the rights that may jeopardize uh, the victims by the, uh, the expiry of the limitations. And recently, the Supreme Court has historically declared uh, the extension of limitations this way. So I briefly, let me say briefly about the Supreme Court, how the Supreme Court has played a role in this access to justice. That the judiciary has also given an equal emphasis on the access to justice. So they have opened uh, the, some of the legal judicial proceedings, including habeas corpus and the COVID-19 related. Every day there are cases on the COVID-19 uh, PIL and these habeas corpus suits. The Supreme Court has also introduced the diversion of juvenile delinquents and the release uh, from the reform homes, the continuation of the judicial administrations, the judicial writings, the promoting execution of judicial services to the recipients, and dissemination of judicial information are something that I can cite over here. So, so despite of the COVID-19 impact and despite of various rights that are jeopardized by this COVID-19, in, in a brief, we can say that the bar associations, even the lawyers and the Supreme Court bar associations has played a very proactive role uh, in, in, in our context, though COVID is not under control. So I think with this brief note, I'd like to conclude that the worldwide, though the worldwide priority is to defeat this deadly COVID-19 virus. However, we, we understand and we are committed that no compromise shall be made over the human rights and the access to justice. So I urge all the lawyers, not only the lawyers in my jurisdictions, all the lawyers from Asia, Europe, and the worldwide lawyers should be united to, 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 to raise their voice and to fight or to uh, work for the access to justice while we are equally fighting against the COVID-19. Thank you, Sham. Thank you very much, Saroj. Uh, and it's my honor to call on Amir Ali Nasir, the Vice President of the Law Society of Hong Kong, to please share his views. Thank you, Sham. Thank you very much for this honor of allowing the law side to speak at this important event. It's a pity we couldn't do it in Kathmandu, but uh, we have this uh, technology. I'm going to be reporting on access to justice for the court system in Hong Kong. Now, we've had um, the general uh, adjournment of proceedings since the 29th of January, immediately after the Chinese New Year holidays. 
our courts were closed and remain closed until the 6th of May, generally. And um, we finally opened all courts on the 29th of May. So that's been a very, very long break. In the meantime, we've not had an e-filing system in Hong Kong, although there was to be a, uh, a, a pilot run because the e-filing system, the technology, the general rules have all been um, created, but there was to be a pilot run on the 20th of January, but that couldn't go ahead because of the uh, general lockdown. And also we were hoping that this legislation and the um, accompanying rules would also be passed through the Legislative Council to enable us to have an e-filing system within the court. We didn't have that. And the consequence of that was that the court was closed. There were firms that had difficulties because of limitation periods that were coming up. And uh, there were many other difficulties on accessing the courts. Of course, the criminal law court, uh, the magistrate's courts dealing with the urgent uh, applications, they were open, but only on a rotational basis to allow one court to be cleaned. And then the, the, the matters moved to another court. So there was a sort of a round robin in relation to the courts that were being used. But that still caused a great deal of uh, denial uh, in the sense that there was a delay and a delay in justice, there's a denied justice. So that was one of the key issues. We also then had a limited number of courts that could allow um, uh, video conferencing facilities. Quite a number of uh, judges actually took on the task of giving rulings that parties could um, make interlocutory applications by way of telephone application. Um, there was one advantage in the sense that the judges were really far behind in their judgments. So within the first two weeks, the judges found time to finish their judgments and really put time. But the difficulty with judges, they're so hardworking that they were quite bored after <laughs> the first month. Um, and that's, that was a waste of resources. Other issues to access of justice was when we had a video conferencing system, we have an ISDN based system for communicating with the court VCF system. Of course, you can use internet as well, but they use primarily the H323 um, um, uh, uh, protocol and many systems uh, cannot uh, uh, accommodate that. So in fact, there are only three, there's Polycom, uh, Cisco and Huawei. Uh, that are capable of connecting. So the Law Society communicated with the courts. The courts have improved the number of the video conferencing facilities and uh, the courts are now working at an internet-based approach as well as software-based ap approaches. The government has given a fund of $50,000 to firms or barristers chambers with five or uh, uh, eight or fewer uh, lawyers within their firm. And so long as they can purchase the equipment, they would get a refund. The other, um, and that is, uh, that period is from 28th of April to the 26th of June. And that is primarily to allow smaller firms to be able to have access to justice. The Law Society has also reduced practicing certificate fees, reduced the premium, and dealt with other judicial systems to enable access to justice. One of the key learnings we've had from the courts is that you know security is an issue, connectivity is an issue, uh, the telephones are an issue, and even simple things like uh, body language has become very important for the judges to observe. Uh, the camera, which should have a zooming function, uh, counsel should not turn their papers and make a noise, should not tap on the on the table, and a whole host of other things we've learned with having video conferencing. I think my time is up, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Shyam. Thank you very much, uh, Amir Ali, for that perspective. Uh, we had one more panelist, was Professor Bo Jiong, who was uh, the, uh, of the, uh, international, the uh, Institute of International Law, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. But unfortunately, he couldn't join us because of a technical hitch. And so I now move to the two outstanding commentators whom we have. We have Julia Spellman, a barrister who specializes in criminal law, uh, in and is based in New Zealand. And may I call on her to share her views on access to justice. Julia? 
Thank you, Sham. Um, and good evening, everyone from New Zealand, um, where it's, it's getting late here now as well. Um, thank you for having me. Just wanted to pick up on some points of similarity from other jurisdictions. So New Zealand um, went into a full four week lockdown uh, on the 25th of March. Um, but unlike some of you, lawyers were considered um, essential workers here. So legal services were part of the exemptions and the Law Society issued a letter to all lawyers to carry with them um, so that if you were stopped by the police, you could um, show that you were allowed to be out of the house. All jury trials were suspended for two months um, when we went into lockdown, but judge alone trials have now resumed. Um, some similar issues with experimenting with technology with virtual hearings. Um, as we all know, the frustrations of when technology doesn't work um, coming to the fore. But in terms of the in-court measures that have been taken, there's been um, screening at the doors, physical distancing, hygiene practice, and trying to stagger court appearance times so that people aren't coming into contact with each other. Um, as always, these things look good on paper, but have been met with different levels of success around the country in some courts um, and some court staff quite simply aren't really managing them in the way that they are meant to. Um, one thing that happened here is the Defence Lawyers Association surveyed defence lawyers in New Zealand to see how everybody felt about moving from um, the highest level of lockdown to when the courts opened up again and whether people felt safe with what had been put in place at their local courthouse. One question that was asked that I thought you might be interested in was, do you feel safe attending court in person as a practitioner, um, including in the answer whether you feel safe for yourself and for those in your family who will be affected um, by your actions? And the response was 22% um, felt safe, 26% did not feel safe and said they would not be attending in person and would be making arrangements to appear by video or to appear by telephone. Um, but the biggest amount, 51%, said, I feel unsafe for myself and those around me, but out of obligation to my client will be attending in person anyway. And I just thought that was a, a point um, which also was in the questions about during this period of difficulty and unknown, you know, what moral obligation do we have as lawyers, particularly for in the criminal work, because almost all of our clients are um, you know, marginalised already, COVID aside, and um, coming from vulnerable parts of society. So um, I was quite proud, at least, of, of a small part of the New Zealand profession who were, you know, putting aside some of their personal um, concerns and, and still wanting to meet their obligations by doing their best job to advocate for their clients. Um, so that was good. And thankfully in New Zealand, um, given our extreme response, closing our border very early and going into complete lockdown, um, where there is now only one case of COVID in the country. So thankfully things are opening back up quite quickly. Um, jury trials haven't yet resumed, and one leftover issue will be making sure that there's not a push to move to judge alone trials just anyway, which is always a tension in our law, um, making sure we do hold on to jury trials, um, and just making sure that in particular the police expanded powers that police were given during this time, um, that scrutiny is put on those to ensure that they're um, warrantless search powers don't continue. So um, sending, sending good, good thoughts and, and strong advocacy vibes to all the other jurisdictions. I know it's very difficult um, in most of the other countries where you're still dealing with the, the ravages of COVID. Uh, so I hope that the New Zealand story at least can, can be a light at the end of the tunnel that things can get better um, and access to justice can continue. So thanks, Ryan. Thank you very much, Julia. And our final commentator is Devansh Mota, who practices before the Supreme Court of India. Devansh, would you please share your views on access to justice and your experience? I think you may have to unmute your microphone. Devansh. Yes. Thank you very Am I much. Audible? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in the, the way Indian courts have moved 
in the past two months offers a slight, a, a, a little very interesting uh, scenario. As far as the Supreme Court is concerned, as soon as the lockdown was uh, ordered, the national lockdown by the government of India, for a, for, for a few days the Supreme Court uh, allowed staggered access because the situation was still being assessed. Once it was declared that there is going to be lockdown, the Supreme Court uh, took steps to, to, to move to virtual court hearings. And somehow uh, they were able to move in that direction quite swiftly. At least the Indian Supreme Court was able to provide a virtual court system uh, uh, quite swiftly, but they began on in a phased manner. First, like in many other jurisdictions, they said extreme urgent matter. Then there was obvious, obviously a debate about what is extreme urgency, what is less than extreme, what is urgent, very urgent. These these uh, these questions came by. Then. Where we are today, where we are today is that we have a Supreme Court today, which is out of 13 courts functioning in about eight courts on a daily basis with a three judge bench virtually. And we have single judges who are doing smaller miscellaneous matters. So we have about 10 courts working on a daily basis virtually with a cause list being published. This is how far we've gone in the last two months. The Supreme Court gave a standard operating procedure about virtual hearing, and now the debate uh, here, as far as virtual hearing is uh, concerned, is focused about the efficacy and the technical glitches that people are facing in terms of switching uh, as an advocate who is now promote, who's trying to argue a case virtually, and a couple of technical glitches which are coming by the way. Having said that, uh, the other parts of the country offer a very interesting mix of views. Uh, long before there have been courts which were already functioning, like say at least for example the Delhi High Court, uh, which was already, some courts were functioning paperless. So some of those courts are, uh, were able to continue in a transitional way uh, uh, far more comfortably. Some courts, say for example Patna, which was, uh, which was not considered, a, uh, uh, the, the state is not considered, uh, state does not uh, 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 is not a state which invites a lot of, say, commercial litigation. It invites a more civil, criminal, that kind of litigation. But even there, they were open to, uh, they were able to act, uh, open up one or two uh, virtual courts for very urgent matters. Having said that, a place like Bombay, which invites a lot of commercial litigation, has the technical wherewithal to carry on with uh, a virtual courts. But because of the nature of spread of virus in that city and the way people live in that city, they have not been able to optimize it to that extent. So this is how our country, uh, at least as far as India is concerned, is functioning. Each state is figuring out where they are in terms of the spread of infection and trying to move virtually. Yesterday, Delhi High Court, just on 1st of June, Delhi High Court, which has now taken, the, uh, taken a march ahead, march forward in terms of virtual court hearing, has come up with uh, a virtual video conferencing protocol. This is as far as the virtual hearing and the courts are concerned. Now, what is the what is by and large happening is that litigants here have a couple of apprehensions. Apprehensions are somewhat similar to what exists in other parts of the country uh, in respect of those litigants who belong who have whose access to technology is very is uh, fairly uneven. So some people. Say, for example, some people are refusing to give consent for a virtual hearing because they feel that they will not be heard properly. For example, the Supreme Court today has issued a direction that all the cases which were filed, say, up to the date of the lockdown were supposed to be taken up and heard. And then they listed a, uh, a, a category of short matters which they were willing to list, and they invited consent. Now, there have been cases where people have out of sure apprehension of how the virtual courts will uh, go by, have not been able to uh, give consent to take virtual hearing forward. Now, there can be a lot of debate about whether this is right or wrong, but in the short time that I have, uh, I, what I wish to point out is that the, the evolution of access to justice in this time only brings an opportunity for the, even the judiciary and everyone to realize that can a parallel digital system be worked out 
for litigation, especially in a country like India where the volumes are so large, because the intention of each court is to grant and dispense with justice, and each state is facing their own peculiar problems. Having said that, I, virtual hearings will never be a substitute to physical hearings. It just perhaps if, if in a couple of, say, six months or a year's time, if everyone is able to build the confidence of the litigant in virtual hearing system or digital or, or, or digital system, that, 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 that is the only way it will achieve success. Otherwise, the, with, with, with the volume that we have today, after a year's time, perhaps people may just uh, uh, take this period as an extreme measure and carry on with the way that things work. So I think this time gives an opportunity to determine what kind of cases can move to tech, uh, to virtual and what should then remain for physical hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deval, for that uh, wrap up and that summary. Uh, we have some questions over here. That we, we received more than a hundred questions, which we circulated in advance to the speakers. And I'm very glad that many of the points which you as registrants had noted while uh, registering and put down as questions have been addressed in some way or the other by this panelists and I'm grateful to them for having done that. There's just one question here which I'm going to take from the Q&A box and I'm going to direct it to Murad uh, because I'm expecting an answer in song. Uh, Sunil Abairatne from Sri Lanka, our friend, says that look, what can Law Asia do about helping online dispute resolution and possibly arbitrations in the Asia Pacific region or the SCAP region and beyond. So any thought of yours, uh, you could sing it out or otherwise, and then I'll move to my closing remarks. Murad. Dispute resolutions, uh, be it commercial or civil, has many private entities and bodies coming forward to introduce their own uh, forum and facilities to accommodate this particular need or industry. Uh, likewise, I think it's a good suggestion uh, through that question that Law Asia, I'm a life member of Law Asia, should and could sit down and uh, think of creating a particular group to ponder, to contemplate, and to design an entity within Law Asia, bringing the best of brain from all around the world to be in the conglomerate so that uh, we can also offer to the world online dispute resolution through Law Asia, being the forum or being the facilitator. That's one. Second, online dispute resolution is as effective as a physical dispute resolution. I have conducted three before, and there is no issue. Say for the system hanging a bit here and there, which doesn't really affect the content and the matter, I think we should uh, take this seriously, thank the person who asked the question, and uh, let's work on it. And I'm willing to go together with all of you on that. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Murad. Uh, President Chungwan Choi, would you have any uh, response on the role of Law Asia in the context of the human rights section? I'm perhaps sort of uh, uh, creating some work for myself over here. But uh, do you have any ideas in terms of what Law Asia might do in the next three or four months, aside from holding these webinars? Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Shyam. Uh, thank you, speakers. Uh, it is uh, very impressive uh, discussions on the human rights uh, under the COVID-19 situation. Law Asia uh, definitely is planning to have more webinars on the various issues uh, to help our members uh, to exchange their knowledge and for their self-training as well. So uh, we are planning more webinars, maybe in July and August, uh, we might uh, be able to have two webinars per week on various issues, including uh, dispute resolution uh, discussions and antitrust and other areas of law as well. So please, please uh, stay in touch with Law Asia and we will dispute the information soon. Thank you very much, Chungwan, which brings us to the end of this webinar. 
and leaves me with these very, very pleasant responsibilities. First and foremost, I want to thank each one of you who has registered and signed in and heard us through. I saw the ticker, which indicates participants touching almost 160 at one point of time, but I'm sure there were many people who came in and left, and I'm very grateful for you, to all of you for have spared the time to have joined us. I'm absolutely honored to have been on a panel, even though in the sort of position of only moderator, but with such a distinguished uh, 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 set of panelists, I thank each one of them for having shared their views on access to justice, on a human rights perspective and beyond from their respective jurisdictions. Uh, I would sort of normally have gone individually, but I realized that I'm a little beyond time. And uh, therefore, I would uh, please treat this as a person and an individual. Thank you. We have two more webinars which are coming up. The co-chair of the Human Rights Section of Law Asia, Professor Yasushi Higashizawa, will next Tuesday be moderating an, another very uh, uh, interesting webinar. And the, and the topic is State Accountability During COVID-19, The Citizen's Right to Know. And I think this would sort of develop on some of the themes which, was, which were mentioned today, the problems with emergency measures, the problems with surveillance, the problems of citizens not getting adequate information out. So what are the responsibilities and duties of the state at a time like this? And then moving on to 16th of June, 2020, Angela Lin, who's a member of the Exco of Loatia, will be moderating a session. And this is again, a very important uh, topic, business and human rights during COVID-19, including digital rights and contact tracing. So this specifically came up uh, when uh, 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 Dr. Pilkyu Huang sort of mentioned it in the context of aggressive contact tracing in um, uh, South Korea. It's happening in India, it's happening in Australia, it's happening in Singapore and across jurisdictions. And we have, again, uh, on those sessions, uh, panelists drawn from several jurisdictions. And I urge each one of you to log in there as well. Uh, I'd be failing in my duty if I didn't thank the, uh, the Secretariat uh, for their immense effort in putting all of this together. So thank you very, very much. And now may I request uh, Magda at the Loatia Secretariat to switch off or the, press that magic button by which we all sort of disappear from each other's screens. And thank you very much, panelists, as well. Thank you. Thank you.